you're there, when you're there, you can open your Bibles to the book of Galatians. Galatians, if you are wondering if you've gone through some sort of time warp, um, I thought we were just hitting chapter 3 in Philippians, what, what happened over the last week, did you give up? Um, no. Uh, one of our practices as a church, if you're new with us over the years, has been to occasionally uh, look at an overview of a large section of Scripture, a survey message, we might call it. Scripture is, is both incredibly broad and infinitely deep, and we want over the life of our church to get a sense of that scope. So, for example, uh, right now we are studying Philippians as a church in an in-depth way, looking at just a few verses at a time, but we also want to sort of zoom out and take a bird's eye view of the book of Galatians this morning. The reason we chose Galatians right now is that in the book of Philippians, as you heard last week from Bart, Paul was addressing the topic of legalism, of trusting in the works of the law or our own righteousness to merit salvation. And there's no book that more thoroughly addresses legalism than Galatians. So we thought this would be an appropriate time to take a one-week break from Philippians and to address this topic again by providing an overview of this book of Galatians. And the hope of these survey series, if, if you've never listened to some of our previous ones, we've done a number in the Old Testament. This is actually our first New Testament survey we've done uh, in our, our life as a church. We've done a survey survey series in Genesis, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges. Those are all on the website. Uh, But the goal of this is not just to provide an overview, but to motivate us in our personal study. The hope is that when we read some of these books, though obviously in a morning like this, I can't provide uh, the depth that you could in a personal study, some of the themes and some of the structure and some of the explanation might help as you study it on your own. That's, that's some of the goal of why we do these kind of overview series. And more importantly, that we would gain a gratefulness for the grandeur of God's Word, the scope of it, the breadth of it, the diversity of it, and that we would love it and be excited to read it. So with that in mind, if you haven't already, turn to Galatians I'm going to read uh, just the first, uh, let's see, 10 verses, and we'll pick up a number of other verses as I work my way through the sermon. But just for now, let's begin by reading the first 10, and then we'll dive in to explain this glorious book this morning. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed." As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Right now, in our home, before bedtime, um, I'm reading my older boys, The Pilgrim's Progress. I'm sure you've heard me reference it uh, in other messages. It's a wonderful allegory of the Christian life. And if you haven't read it, I would strongly encourage you to read it. It's wonderfully edifying. 
And in one of the moments, uh, the main character, whose name is intentionally Christian, uh, as he walks on his way towards the road of salvation and away from the city of destruction and condemnation because of his burden for his sin, he meets a man named the worldly wise man. And this man tries to comfort him that he doesn't have to go in this road of salvation that will be met with some trials and difficulty and suffering. He doesn't have to go that way because there is another way he can go that he can be eased of some of his troubles. And so he directs him just up that hill, worldly wise man says. You'll find a town, and if you live in that town, you'll find it to be a delightful place to live. Christian approaches this hill, but the hill seems threatening to him. He looks up and he sees how dangerous it seems to be to climb this hill. And he notices there's an overhanging cliff that at any moment seems like it might fall down on his head. He notices even fire coming from the hill. He notices there's a, a sense of, of danger and, and almost, almost wrath pouring out of this hill. And he wonders what he should do. He feels helpless and hopeless. And then down through the fields... The man who first met him, named Evangelist, comes to him again. He says, Christian, what are you doing here? This is not the way of salvation. For John Bunyan, who wrote this allegory, that hill represented the attempt to earn your salvation by the works of the law. Attempting to look at some of God's Old Testament laws and, and see them as a ladder by which we could climb our way to God. And in the allegory, a Christian is rebuked sternly by this evangelist. Say, this is, this is not the way of grace. This is not God's way of salvation. You cannot be saved by attempting to climb up that hill. This is the way of destruction. I think Bunyan was attempting to allegorize essentially what takes place in Galatians, where Paul comes like evangelist does to Christian, and he appeals to these Galatian churches, what, what are you doing? There is no way to be made right with God by the works of the law. You are turning away from the gospel of grace. There, there, there is no partnership between the works of the law and the gospel of grace. You, you cannot climb that mountain. It will crush you. There is no end there but condemnation and death. That's what Paul's trying to say. The, the central theme of Galatians, we might say, is we must hope in Christ and Christ alone for our righteousness before God. We must hope in Christ and Christ alone for our righteousness before God. And that alone is very significant. Because in these churches of Galatia, people were not saying that Christ was not important or even that he was not the Messiah. They were simply saying that Christ was insufficient for salvation unless one also kept the works of the Old Testament law. They were infiltrating the church. They were attempting to persuade these Gentile believers who had come to faith when Paul planted the churches in this area by believing in Jesus, they were persuading them, yes, that's very good, but it's not enough. You must obey the works of the law, particularly the covenant rite of circumcision that all of the Jewish nation had always followed as a way of marking out their dedication to the Lord. And they're saying, you must be circumcised, you must do these works of the law, or you are not truly belonging to the Lord Jesus. Well, Paul gets a report that his young, infant even, churches have been persuaded by some of this teaching. They're being influenced. They're being affected. And so he writes to protect and warn and to confront them. It's a stern letter, but it's the kind of sternness that a parent has with a child who is about to do something to their own harm and neglect something that is for their good. It's the way a, a father speaks to a child who's, who's choosing a terrible course of action that will harm him and inviting him to come back to a delightful course of action that will bless him. 
This isn't the annoyed father who's frustrated that his child has interrupted his day. This is the father who genuinely loves his children and doesn't want them to be harmed and calls them away from something damaging and to something life-giving. That's Paul to these loved churches in Galatia. Just for the sake of understanding this letter, I'm going to break it into three sort of loose categories, all right? This is a very basic structure of Galatians. You could obviously uh, break it in much more uh, complexly than this, uh, but this, is, this will give you a basic idea. Galatians basically follows three main themes, one after the other. The first is the source of the gospel. Paul's at great pains to point that out. And then it's the gospel and the law, and he deals with how the gospel relates to the law, especially the law of the Old Testament. And then he concludes the letter talking about the gospel and godliness. So if you want a basic structure of Galatians, uh, that's it. The source of the gospel, the gospel and the law, that's the lengthiest section, and then the gospel and godliness. And all of this is designed to motivate the Galatians, trust in Christ and Christ alone for your righteousness before God. And then he teases out the implications. So let's dive in, first of all, into this idea of the source of the gospel. The source of the gospel. Paul starts out this letter by reminding the Galatians of who he is, that he is an apostle from God and not from man. You notice that in in verse 1. So right from the opening verse, Paul sends a salvo across the bow of this Galatian church. I am not giving you a man-made gospel because I am not a man-made apostle. Apparently, uh, these opponents were trying to denigrate Paul and thereby denigrate his message, and Paul starts off right away declaring, no, no, my commissioning as an apostle was directly from the risen Jesus Christ. He goes on in barely disguised points in verses 3 and following to point out that Jesus gave himself for our sins. He's going to pick that up up, up later as he progresses through the letter. And then he launches in verse 6 this remarkable paragraph expressing his astonishment that you are deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. Paul could not be more stark in this opening paragraph. And it's very helpful to appreciate how unusual this is for Paul. Almost every other letter that Paul writes, verse 6 would say something like, I thank my God in all my remembrance or view. Or, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or, I am so grateful to hear that your faith is being proclaimed and known in all the world and that you're growing in Christ. Some kind of gratefulness or celebration of the blessings they have in Christ would almost without fail be in verse 6. So Paul's astonishment right at the outset of this letter is making a stern and remarkable point about the importance of the danger of legalism. Trusting something other than Christ to save you or adding something to Christ as the basis for your salvation. That's what legalism is. And that's what Paul's saying is taking place in this church. And he dispenses from his ordinary thankfulness to get right to that point because of how important it is. P.T. O'Brien says this about the unusual nature of this opening from Paul. He says, Because the Galatians have departed from the gospel of Christ, there can be no thanksgiving. Instead, a curse is pronounced on anyone who brings another message. That's how seriously Paul takes this topic. Now, when Paul says, then, in verse 11, you want to look down there in your Bibles, I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. He's making a connection. He started verse 1 saying, I am not an apostle that was chosen by a mere man nor is my gospel coming merely from men. He's addressing what probably was one of the charges or accusations of these opponents. Likely, it seems like, they were attempting to minimize Paul's authority and thereby undermine the gospel of grace that he'd been teaching. F.F. Bruce uh, references this when he says, The Galatian converts were being urged to observe ceremonies of the Old Testament law as integral to the gospel and to accept doctrine of justification by personal merit. Since Paul's preaching excluded all this, it must be undermined by an attempt to diminish his status in the eyes of his converts. 
He continues elsewhere. These Judaizers argued the Jerusalem leaders are the only persons with authority to say what the true gospel is. And this authority they received direct from Christ. Paul has no comparable authority. Any commission he exercises was derived by him from the Jerusalem leaders. And if he differs from them on the content or the implications of the gospel, he is acting and teaching quite arbitrarily. So Paul is at pains through the rest of chapter 1 and a large portion of chapter 2 to defend a couple of things. First of all, he received his revelation of the gospel when Jesus Christ himself visibly showed himself to Paul. Paul, in a moment of divine revelation, understood Jesus Christ, the crucified one, is the Messiah. And he is the conclusion of the law as a way to relating to God. He is the end of that law. And in that moment of revelation, there wasn't any human mediator speaking to Paul. He's saying, no, I encountered Christ himself directly. Furthermore, Paul says, I had very little interaction with the Jerusalem apostles in the early years of my ministry. So this argument that basically everything I know came from them, and so if I'm getting something wrong, it must be that I, I misunderstood or I've somehow uh, diluted or polluted uh, the gospel that I received from them. Paul says, no, I, I, I went from that revelation to immediately begin ministering in the church, I was a part of the church in another part of the, the Middle East. I, I was not connected to them or dependent on them in some fundamental way. So he describes this repeatedly. Let, let's pick up uh, in chapter 2, verse 11, where, where Paul says, I'm sorry, uh, 2, verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus, that's a, a Greek fellow um, Christian, along with me, I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But, listen to this, even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet, because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus... So they might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, Verse 9, and when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Here, here's the point to summarize all of that. They agree with me. They agreed with me that the gospel of God's grace did not require conformity to the Old Testament law. So I wasn't interacting with them in the early years, and then when I did interact with them, they agreed with me, so much so that my own Greek companion was not required to be circumcised by those elders in Jerusalem. What's he doing? He's countering this attempt to undermine his authority, because he knows undermining his authority will undermine the authority of the gospel he preaches. He's countering it. And so that's what he does throughout the remainder of chapter 2. So much so that then in, in the beginning of, you, if you turn your page, in verse 11, it says that when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, Paul opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now when you get to chapter 2 and verse 14, we come to the end of Paul's biographical introduction where his main goal was to undermine these opponents, claiming Paul doesn't know what he's talking about, you shouldn't trust him, and you shouldn't trust the gospel he proclaims. Paul says, God is the source of the gospel of grace that I have proclaimed. And if you reject this gospel, you reject God himself. 
If you claim to cling to legalism or works to earn your way to heaven, you are actually going to be cursed. That's how serious this is. Paul says, not only are are you to be resisted if you believe that, even Peter himself, when he attempted to go out of step with this gospel, was rebuked publicly because of how serious this was. Now, this is incredibly valuable for us because Paul is saying emphatically, the gospel of God's grace and not of works for righteousness before God was commissioned by, endorsed by, and proclaimed from Christ himself to those who accurately represent him. This is good news for the church. It means that the gospel of grace, which no human would dare to believe, is God's own gospel. The gospel of grace and not works is God's own gospel commissioned directly from him. And no one, not even representatives from the church of Jerusalem itself, can contradict that gospel and be right before God. God is the source of the gospel of grace. And God will oppose anyone who dares claim that that gospel is insufficient. That's why I think Paul brings this overwhelmingly unusual correction to anyone who teaches differently in chapter 1. F.F. Bruce helps explain, If the law was still in force as the way of salvation and life, the messianic age had not yet dawned, and Jesus accordingly was not the Messiah. In that case, Jesus had been rightly convicted and sentenced because his messianic claims were false. Any teaching which logically led to such a conclusion was for Paul self-evidently perverse. And anyone who implied by such teaching that Jesus was anathema was himself anathema, cursed. Paul says there there is no middle ground here. Bart made an excellent point last week about this idea of a, a middle ground. And Paul says, no, no, there is no friendship between a works based salvation and the salvation that comes from God himself. God has offered one way of salvation, the salvation that is all of grace and not of works. And there is no work you can add to it that God will count as a reasonable compromise. God will count it to be curse-worthy to attempt to claim that Jesus was insufficient. That's what Paul is saying in the first two chapters of Galatians. But then he realizes, I think, that there could be an objection, a concern. Well, Paul, Paul... What about the law? What, what, what person who knows the history of the law could claim that God wasn't also the source of the law? He surely was the source of the law. How are we to view the law, Paul? All of those verses, chapter after chapter after chapter, of ceremonial laws in the Old Testament, how are we to view those? How are we to view circumcision as a requirement to belong to the people of God? How are we to view these things? So the next lengthy chapter of Galatians, you might summarize the gospel and the law. The gospel and the law. Paul goes through a number of points. I'm just going to summarize uh, six of them very briefly. They'll be on the screen. You can just read them and study them on your own, okay? Six points. He just progresses through these. It's a tour de force for how the law should be rightly viewed by the Christian. What God intended the law to do and how it relates to salvation. So six points, we'll just hit them quickly. First of all, justification is only by faith. Paul makes this very clear in chapter 2, verse 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Paul's saying, look, if even Jews can't be justified by works of the law, even faithful Jews like Paul, then certainly Gentiles have no chance to be justified by works of the law. There is no righteousness before God that can be created by an individual doing works even of God's law, let alone their own manufactured religion. Justification is only by faith. This central paragraph, verses 15 and following, it almost is like a mountaintop in the middle of Galatians to proclaim Paul's made point very clearly. But then he progresses. 
Second point, the law leads to a curse which can only be escaped through Christ. It can only be escaped through Christ. He picks it up in verse 10 of chapter 3. All who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. It's likely that these, these Judaizers were attempting to say, Look, just be circumcised if you're a Gentile. Maybe just do a few of the, the, the laws that are required. And weren't being honest to acknowledge that the law requires perfect faithfulness. Perfect. You can't just obey a few things. And that could be a danger even in how people view the law today. To think that faithfulness to the law is doing a few things that maybe are, are kind of reasonably accomplished in our day and age, and that is keeping the law? No, Paul would say. That's contrary to the law itself. The law says, cursed is the one who doesn't do all of these things. The nature of the law is that it must be obeyed perfectly or the curse will come completely. That's the nature of the law. But, Paul says, I have good news. It is evident in verse 11 that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Here's the good news. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The law leads to a curse which can only be escaped through Christ. He's saying it's foolishness to think that you can obey part of a law that that law itself says can only be escaped if you obey it perfectly. What, what kind of foolishness, what kind of lying teaching is this, Paul says? No, the only escape from the curse of disobedience is Christ himself, who suffers in the place of one who is under God's judgment. Third part about the law. The promise of faith preceded the law. Here's maybe an unexpected argument from Paul. He describes it briefly in 3.7. Know then it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham... The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Picks it up again in 316. The promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. (laughs) He's using their own Bible against them. He's saying, if you remember your own Bible, the Bible makes it abundantly clear. Abundantly clear that God brought righteousness to Abraham by a faith in him and not by keeping the works of the law. Remarkable. He says the the law preceded, the promise of faith preceded even the giving of the law. It came before it. The law must have a different purpose than salvation because the, the gift of faith came before the law. Section 4, the law was never meant to save us, but to prepare us for salvation. Verse 23 says that before faith came, we were held captive under the law. In chapter 4, verse 1, he says, we were like an underage child. Though he's destined to receive an inheritance, for a time he's more like a slave, completely under the direction of a guardian, a guardian called the law. Paul says we had no independence. We were under the authority of the law, but that law was never meant to be our guardian forever, just like a child is never meant to act like a child forever. How absurd for a grown person to want to give up all of their adult privileges, to have all of their accounts frozen, to have their driver's license taken away, their independence removed, and placed back in the constraints of childhood again. No, says Paul, this was never God's intention. The external restraints of the law were meant to guard God's people until the moment that they came of age, and their inheritance in Christ was revealed. So Paul says in verse 5 and 6, 
because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Five, the law endorses justification by faith. Paul, in the second half uh, half of chapter four, he gives a a lengthy analogy from the Old Testament about how Abraham, being told he was going to have an abundance of children, chose, rather than trusting God, to attempt to accomplish the goal naturally by uniting with Hagar, this, this slave. But he says, you'll remember that in that union, there was no promise given ultimately. The promise of a great inheritance was not given to the sons of Hagar. It was given to the son who came miraculously by the gift of God, Sarah in her old age. Paul says this is, this is like an allegory of those who try to accomplish uh, God's inheritance in their own works and those who simply receive it by faith. It's, it's analogous of that. So he uses this to point out, look, the law itself makes clear you cannot create God's gift through your own works, through your own effort, through human strength. Just as Abraham could not create the child of promise through his own strength, God would have none of it. No, the inheritance will come by gift or not at all. Finally, he gets to his conclusion. Do not submit to the law for justification. Do not submit to the law for justification. Chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obliged to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Now, important point to make. Paul is not concerned with the practicality, like circumcision or eating a certain kind of meat or not eating a certain kind of meat. He's not concerned with these actions per se. He's concerned with them as an act attempting to justify someone before God. Very important difference. It's not as though it's wrong in and of itself for a child to be circumcised. No, that's, that's not Paul's concern at all. He actually recommends that one of his fellow members be circumcised so to give no offense to Jewish communities where he travels. He's not concerned with the, the action so much as the heart behind it. When the heart behind it is an attempt to self-justify, Paul says, you cannot be a part of Christ and try to justify yourself at the same time. Even to do a good thing, like a work of the law. If you place in that good work the motive that you're trying to add to the finished work of Christ, then you cannot belong to the one who will save you completely by himself or not at all. Now, all of these lengthy arguments, they're they're designed to press on to his dear, beloved children in the faith to not believe that Christ was insufficient. Do not give in to the idea that you must add some legal work in order to be saved. Do not submit to this yoke. It is a yoke none of your forefathers of the faith were able to bear. Do not believe that you can earn your way to God. To do that is to denigrate Christ, is to denounce the one thing that can certainly save you, and that is the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Do not believe that you and your efforts can merit something before God, that Christ Christ has not already merited for you. Believe in Christ alone. The law had a wonderful purpose and continues to be useful in providing a revelation of God's character and speaking of many of our our moral responsibilities that we have also in Christ. But as a ceremony that is to be added to Christ, it cannot save you. So he appeals to them. He pleads with them. And I think he would plead with us. Listen, this is God's son. Do not dare to believe that anything can be added to him as necessary for your salvation. Do not dare to believe that he was insufficient in bearing the curse of that law. 
or picking and choosing parts of that law are, are somehow adding to him in righteousness before God. No, Paul says, do not submit to that yoke. This lengthy teaching, it's punctuated by these personal appeals, expressions of concern and anguish, all designed to reveal that the gospel of grace through faith is the gospel revealed in the very law that these false teachers are promoting. Paul uses their own law to point out that the gospel was the ultimate goal of the law, that the promise of salvation through faith preceded the law, and to urgently appeal to them to reject using the law contrary to God's purpose for the law and to replace the good news of grace. But Paul's not done yet. He's not done yet because I think he recognizes yet another, perhaps more humble, question from the congregation. But, but Paul, what about godliness? Without the law, the, the, the Gentiles, surely are, they're just going to give in to their same pagan ways. Surely that can't be right, Paul. Surely that must be wrong. Surely it can't be the case that just believing in Jesus means you can go sin boldly and act just like the world. Surely, surely not, Paul. Commentator Richard Longnecker makes this point very well. He says, on a practical basis, the opponents in Galatia must have included in their message an emphasis on the Jewish law as divinely appointed as a way to check libertinism within the church, having too much liberty to sin, I think is the basic definition of that word. Paul's emphasis on the pedagogical function of the law coming to an end with Christ and living in the direction of the Spirit as opposed to life directed by the law as the antidote to libertinism suggests that not only do the opponents argue circumcision as a prerequisite for being fully accepted to God, but also that they asserted that life lived under the Torah, which meant for them a Jewish lifestyle, was the only way to bring the excesses of the flesh into line. He's basically saying, look, if if you don't have the law, you're going to have a bunch of worldly churches. That's my paraphrase. If you don't have the law, you're going to have a bunch of sinful, worldly Gentiles who don't know how to be different from their idolatrous, sensual neighbors. That can't be right, Paul. Surely that's not what you're saying. And Paul says, no. No, no. But the law does not externally constrain the church. Instead, in the gospel, The very Spirit of God has written His law of righteousness on their hearts so that now, under the constraints of the Spirit, they fulfill in lived-out fashion the morality that the law called them to anyway. Let me show you the miracle of God's purpose in the gospel. The external ceremonies of the law were concluded in Christ. They were a temporary provision to guard God's people until Christ came. But it's not as though God stopped caring about godliness. No, rather he planted himself in their hearts so that they would now do and be the very morality that God called them to with the external law. So we have, for example, as we look down in verse 13, you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Incredibly, the book which absolutely denounces using the works of the law to merit salvation also has some of the strongest language requiring godliness from the people of God. Let me say it again. The book of the Bible that has some of the strongest language denouncing legalism also has some of the strongest language calling the people of God to godliness as the result of their belief in Jesus. If we read chapter 5, verse 16, Paul says very clearly, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. These are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. How do you know if you're not under the law? If you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Listen to this sentence. I warn you, 
as I warned you before. Listen to this. Let it sink in. This is Galatians. This is Galatians. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, sometimes because we, we love the idea of bashing legalism, and we should, we should, we define it unbiblically. Legalism is trusting in our works to save us or adding works to the requirement of a Christian that God does not put on them. Legalism is not any kind of obedience and godliness. Because Galatians itself says that those who pursue a lifestyle of sinfulness will not get into heaven. Now, it's not the basis of their righteousness, but it is the necessary outcome of it. And in the eternal perspective of God, there is only one kind of person that will get into heaven. Those who have received the righteousness of Christ and in whom that righteousness has been lived out as they are led by the Spirit. Now, their lived-out righteousness does not replace or add to the righteousness of Christ. It's not an addition. But it is the definite result of those who have come under the influence of the Spirit. So we have to be careful, church, that in our preaching against legalism or reacting to legalism, we not act as though anybody who is feeling conviction of sin or anyone who is declaring we must resist ungodliness is automatically a legalist. Not according to Paul. The faithful preacher of Galatians must say both these things with equal clarity. There is no justification by works of the law. If you do not reject the works of the flesh, you will not get into heaven. Both are proclaimed by Paul, the preacher of God's grace. He sees no contradiction. Because to come to Christ is to receive his spirit. To receive his spirit is to receive a power that exceeds the works of the flesh. And so, yes, Christians must be godly. They will be godly under the influence of the Spirit, but they will not trust their godliness as meriting salvation. We're called, Paul says in verse 20 and 21, to fulfill the law, as he says, to love one another by caring for those. Verse 6.1 says, If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Notice, he does not say, Don't you dare say anything to them, because that's legalism. No, he says, Restore them. Get them to stop sinning. But in a spirit of gentleness. Bear one another's burdens, he says. Oh, that's, that's legalism. I'm not bearing any burdens. I'm free in Christ. No, you, you are free to serve. You're free from justifying yourself, and you are set free to bear up others. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And various commands follow. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that will he also reap. There's a a verse that's surprising in Galatians. The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary in doing good. Let's define legalism biblically. It means, according to Galatians, not trusting in our works to save us, not adding works to God's requirement for the Christian, especially those of the Old Testament law that are concluded in Christ. But it also means pursuing godliness under the influence of the Spirit as a a way of rejecting what you might call an an anti-legalism, legalism. There's some people that it almost feels like the main law that they hold on to is pointing out any effort at godliness as being legalism. And they seem more bound by that than any Old Testament law that was ever binding on the people of God. Paul says, no, you're, you're set free from the restraints of the law and from the restraints of the flesh. You are to be servants of Christ, rejoicing in the justification that God has given you and the spirit that he has given you to live out the righteousness that you've received by faith in Christ. Christians are to believe two things. They cannot trust the ceremonial law of Moses, 
as the basis for their salvation. In fact, they can't trust any works that they do as earning them salvation before God because salvation is by grace through faith. But at the same time, there is a way of life that comes through the Spirit to those who believe in the true gospel, the way of godliness, that if they reject, they will not receive the kingdom of heaven because the true gospel also brings with it a life in the Spirit that produces godliness and not the fruit of the flesh. In my experience, we all need the full teaching of Galatians at various moments in our lives. Sometimes we're prone to try to climb that mountain. To make up for our sins by our tears. To make up for our sins by our good works. To search the scriptures for something we can do to earn merit with God. Sometimes even in the same day, we're looking for ways to indulge our flesh. Paul says, has come to Christ. In Christ, there is the solution to the law and to the flesh. Come to Christ. Enjoy him. Reject any idea that you can earn your way to heaven. Reject those subtle feelings of guilt that that cling to the back of your conscience, wondering, "How, how how can I merit God's favor today? Paul says, reject those ideas. Merit comes only by the righteousness of Jesus Christ granted to you freely as a gift. Stop climbing that mountain. It will only crush you and walk in the way of life and freedom and obedience, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Galatians does not flatter us, but like a father, it calls us to the wonderful blessing of life in Christ that God has desired to give us. Some of the strongest language in the New Testament, other than some of the warnings of Jesus himself, are in this book. And yet they're warnings from a father calling us to enjoy what God wants us to enjoy. Don't trust your own righteousness. Don't submit to the works of the law. Enjoy what has come. You have come of age in the time of Christ. We sing a song that's perhaps the best song to sing, thinking about the book of Galatians. It says this, No list of sins I have not done. No list of virtues I pursue. No list of those I am not like can earn myself a place with you. Oh God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner through and through. My only hope of righteousness is not in me, but only you. No humble dress, no fervent prayer, no lifted hands, no tearful song, no recitation of the truth can justify a single wrong. My righteousness is Jesus' life. My debt was paid by Jesus' death. My weary load was borne by him, and he alone can give me rest. No separation from the world, no work I do, no gift I give can cleanse my conscience, cleanse my hands. I cannot cause my soul to live. But Jesus died and rose again. The power of death is overthrown. My God is merciful to me and merciful in Christ alone. My righteousness is Jesus' life. My debt was paid by Jesus' death. My weary load was borne by him and he alone can give me rest. Now, in my experience, there's, there's two ways to sing that song, and both are appropriate. We're going to sing it in just a moment. One is as an expression of confession. As in, I have been trusting those things, and I now acknowledge that they are unworthy to trust in. Another way is as an expression of, of declaration, of boasting in the Lord Jesus. I will not trust those things. I reject those things. I would encourage you to practice both as we sing through this song. I've had moments in my life where it was necessary for me to list out all the things I could boast in. I remember doing this as a, in, a, in a journal moment one time, just listing out all the things I could, even dumb things, that I could boast in before God. 
things I remember from when I was a kid and a good ball game and, you know, obeying my parents and I didn't lie that time. And I just began to list out anything I could think of. And then I just began to cross them out with a line. They are not my standing before God. I will not trust in them. And in other moments, we can, we can come to words like that. We can declare to the glory of Jesus, no, I, I don't trust in any of those things. There is nothing in me. And that's gloriously freeing because I'm saying to the Lord Jesus, you are enough. My salvation is found completely in you. So let's do that as we sing. And, and I would encourage you, carry these words with you into this week. When that desire to boast in your work comes into your heart, or that fear that you're not made up for your sins comes into your heart, boast in the finished work of Christ, the righteousness that is given as a gift. Stop climbing the mountain and go in the way of salvation. Christ himself offers it to you, and he intends for you to take it freely and to enjoy it every day. Let's stand and sing together.